Hey guys, welcome to a windy, sunny spring Sunday in California. You're going to hear the wind beating around on my shed. Um, but I've decided to call this episode Details Matter. Now, at work, I work for a city that has the highest demanding constituents and there's a lot going on there and there's not a lot of room to make mistakes. So even though some of the stuff we do is fairly common in terms of what it is, there's a demand there for service levels really high. And my director, P. Shauna, <laughs> I bet you never thought you'd be in a, <laughs> you'd get a shout out in a uh, YouTube video about cigar box guitars and junk pile guitars. But yeah, here's to you, Shauna. Her motto is details matter. So we're going to wrap up a guitar here and I'm going to show you a couple examples of details do matter okay you notice i've done a quick wardrobe change i've got an arlo guthrie t-shirt on and um yeah because this guitar that you've been watching me make this last one from oklahoma you've seen me crank out one oklahoma license plate guitar that went to my friend melly bucks camper who is my official uh, guitar transporter to oklahoma so uh, yeah, that's Melly Bucks Camper's Interstate Junk Pile Guitar Transporting Service. Shout out to you, Melly Bucks Camper. Now, my other Oklahoma connection that I want to say hi to is R.T. Valine. All, all of us in L.A. know uh, R.T. from R.T. and the 44s. Um, that's our music playing in the background today. Check that out, R.T. and the 44s. I'm going to give you a link below. But RT has a connection to the annual Woody Guthrie Festival. And this guitar is going there as soon as we wrap it up. So I'm going to go through some of the details here on this, the final details, and show you um, some people like making guitars with cigar boxes that are just perfect. Everything about the neck is perfect. My stuff, I don't want it to be perfect. I want it to look like it's, it's led a long, hard life already. And um, well, that's why my stuff is called, oh, it's under here. Anyway, never mind, back to Arlo Guthrie and Woody Guthrie. Let's stay on that topic. So I kind of want to give you a little background here. You know I'm a blues fanatic. And whether you like this guy or not, Alan Lomax, his recordings, as well as his father, John Lomax, his recordings early on for the Library of Congress, are really outside of Paramount Records. The only reason we have some recordings from like people like Sun House and Charlie Patton and Robert Johnson and some people like that. So um, a lot of people don't understand Alan Lomax. There are stories about him paying people in Coca-Cola. There was a lot of mistrust going on. He'd be down in the South and it, was, it wasn't really a time. I don't know how to pol politically say this in a politically correct way, but it wasn't time for somebody of his race to be going down saying he's collecting music recordings uh, from early folk artists and blues artists, especially in uh, North Hill country of Mississippi. Anyway, um, this book, Alan Lomax, The Man Who Recorded the World, check that out. It's available on audiobook. I'll give you a link below. This is a really good listen if you want to know what Alan Lomax was all about and what his life on the road was like making his recordings. But about the 1940-41 time period is where he ran across Woody Guthrie. And Woody Guthrie was appearing on his radio shows that he was putting out all the way through the war, World War II in support of the morale of our troops who were fighting overseas in Japan as well as the European theater. So I do have an interest in Woody Guthrie and especially his tie back to Alan Lomax. Anyway, enough for the history lesson. You know, you all know I'm a blues history bug, and I hope uh, you like <laughs> the hints I give you to run off down your own rabbit hole. Anyway, back to Woody Guthrie and this guitar. The Woody Guthrie Annual Con uh, Festival, Folk Festival, is in Okima, Oklahoma in July every summer. This, this year, it's July 10th through the 14th, again in Okima, Oklahoma. I am shipping this out with Melly Bucks Camper 
uh, in about a week with some other guitars going to Oklahoma. She's going out there to visit and she's going to drop this off. So once we wrap this up today, it's going to her. And if you just happen to be in Okima, Oklahoma at the Woody Guthrie Festival, you might just see this very guitar played on stage, probably by somebody named R.T. Valine. And then I think what they're going to do is they're going to auction it off once it gets a couple of signatures on it. I would really, really like to know that Arlo Guthrie would be there by chance and he would sign it. And then some lucky individual is going to get this. Um, it's the least I can do to support folk music in this country. So that said, let's hit the bench. We're going to put some final details on here to make this thing look nice and junky and wrap it up. I want to remind you one more time, down below is going to be a, a subscribe button in the middle. Click that, hit the bell so you get notified. Check out my playlist. And let's not forget um, to give RT and the 44s a look at their music. And there's a link below. Let's get to work. Okay, guys, we are sticking to uh, the theme Details Matter. Now, I've got a couple of these sound hole covers that were reduced down to 75% that I had uh, Michael Breedlove from MGB Guitars make, and I've been really happy with them. And these Route 66 ones for Oklahoma guitar are really nice. Uh, and while you certainly could stick this on the guitar um, just like that and it would be pretty cool it's certainly not as cool looking as one that's been painted to age like a uh, a sign a real sign that's been out on the road for a while now I want you to get in the right frame of mind and um, and think about if you were a sign sitting out on Route 66 for the past 40 years, what would you look like? Well, if you're pointed towards the sun in the afternoon, you might be faded, you might be rusty. Um, this this badge here, or this uh, one here, kind of would match the fade pattern you might see. Um, but you certainly wouldn't look like wood. So I'm going to kind of show you real quick how to take one of these and turn it into this. The first thing I'm going to want to do is when I paint this and get this all done and get it the way I want, I'm not going to want to drill the holes in this where uh, they need to be and then risk messing up my paint job. So there's space between the U1 route and that peak right there. And so I'm going to take the small drill bit that I use to put tuners and the like on and I'm going to drill that hole there and go through and then I'm going to flip this around and do the same thing down here. Now, once I'm done, I can always take a toothpick or something and stick it in there every time I paint or something like that and clear it out. But that way, if you get this done out of the way now and take a little file and get the rough spots where you drilled through out of the way, that's going to make things a lot easier. So Now, you can see that in this one, I'm going to want that to be black down in there and all this stuff to be black like this. So, I'm just going to take some black paint and a brush and we're going to make this whole thing black. Now I'm just taking acrylic paint. I got this handy little paint holder here that allows me to, to get some paint on the brush. I like using these flat brushes, but I'm just going around the whole thing and painting it black. I want to make sure that I get down in where it says route and all these lines really well. I also want to come in from the bottom like so and get the insides of the 66 or whatever number I got there done. I'm going to want to get the edges done as well like so. We're going to let that dry. I don't want to use oil paint. I don't want to use magic markers or sharpies or anything on this right now because if something is a different type of configuration, if it's oil versus acrylic versus latex or whatever, you're going to end up with stuff blended. But you want to set this aside now and let it dry thoroughly. Now, I've, I've taken the badge that I painted completely black, and I'm taking 
again, a flat brush with longer bristles. And I've got some white in my paint tray here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that I don't glob a lot of paint on there, that I get it thin. You want to remember with paint, it's a lot easier to put more on because you can't take more off. Now, what I do is wherever I've got to go close to where the black is, I'm going to lay this brush really flat like so and just drag it this way. Do you see that? Now, if I do it that way versus going like this, I'm going to drag paint down into those lines. But I'm just going to very patiently again put a little bit on, drag it on here so I can see the beauty of, of this acrylic paint is it's water-based. And I, can, I always want to go this way towards the line, never perpendicular to, or, or parallel to the line because the paint will drop down in there. But I'm just going to do like so until this whole thing is painted. Now, you'll notice it really doesn't matter if I make this whole thing completely white because then it looks brand new. Maybe I want to let some of this bleed through like so. All right, we're wrapping up down to the end. I got a little bit of black bleeding through here and there, and that's okay. Um, the main thing is I didn't fill up the lines. I want to get just a little bit more right there, like so. Now, the last thing I want to do here is put a little bit of red, again, acrylic paint, and then I can take my brush and I can dab just a little bit of it over here. Take a little bit of black right there and a little bit of white. And I want to mix these up until I get this kind of salmon-y weird color. I'm after rust here. Now, there's two ways to put the rust on. I really don't want to use a, a brush and dab it on here and there. What I want to do is, again, I want to figure out if I'm sitting on the edge of Route 66 outside of Groom, Texas, and I've been sitting there for 60 some years, and the sun's been coming up and coming down, and the rain's been hitting me. I want to try to imagine where the rust might gather, and it's going to be surface rust, it's going to be film rust. So I'm going to take either a piece of sponge that I've cut out of one of these brushes like this, and I can dab it in that rust, and then I'm just going to go like so down here, right there, and the way water would run on the sign, like so. See that? Then I can take a clean brush and run it over a little bit and drag it out. And it'll look like it's just got a little hint of rust on there like that. Now, I can take my toothpick once everything is dry push it through right there and right there where my screws are going to go to mount it on the neck like that and it looks like some has been out there for a while it looks pretty good up against uh, this backdrop of Oklahoma map and you'll notice Okima is right in the middle of the headstock that's where the festival is also notice that I've blackened off the sides of the badge and that the part where um, where the 66 is, the edges are blackened out as well as what's below on the map. So there's one example of some detail that makes this look way older than it really is. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is box corners. Box corners to me serve a very functional purpose, a very practical purpose, uh, just like when I tell you I caulk the insides of the box to make sure it's set up. It's the whole reason I use Camacho boxes. It's these boxes are thick. I can drop them. I can smash them around, but I don't want my corners beat up. So I will put on a box corners. Now there are a number of different box corners of both size, style, and configuration. And if you're one of these purists that want to keep this box just perfect, including the scorpion here, you might want to put a really shiny uh, box corner on. But that's not typically my style. I go for the opposite effect. This is all beat up. I painted it. I sanded it off. This is all scraped up and stained up. It looks like barn wood. So on this guitar, 
this just way way out of place so let me show you a couple tricks okay one of the things I like to do is I like to have uh, something look a little rustic now I could use this but again that sticks out like a sore thumb I don't like that but I might want some of this bleeding through I might actually want some chrome bleeding through um, and so what I could do is I could just take a piece of sandpaper or uh, clip this on a vice grips or something and run it to the belt sander and rough these up like so just rough up all sides and then I can take a color of paint uh, this is satin canyon black it's a good color because it doesn't give you some shiny uh, black metal but I would just paint this whole thing a couple of times and because I roughed it up the paint will stick and then once it's all dry and I'm ready to mount it I would just take a file or some sandpaper and scuff it a little bit where you think it would wear and that would typically be right here right here and what you'll have is you'll have this stuff shining out from the bottom it will give you this black worn look but you'll see hints of metal sticking out it gives you a really good look now on this guitar I found these at a craft store that y'all know and love. Anyway, I've put them down and I've taken my small bit and I've pre-drilled the holes here and here. There's my glasses when I need them. And then I'm going to run the screws in here. And you can see that there's an embossed pattern on here that uh, appears to be baked into whatever the finish is let me put the screws on here and kind of show you uh, what I'm going to do I'm not going to use black screws here because I do want a little bit of contrast you see here that this is made out of a piece of galvanized sheet metal and I do have some uh, aged screws on here and stuff but there's a little bit of shiny metal so that's what I'm going to put there and then I'm going to show you the trick Okay, that looks good. I got a little hint of uh, metal uh, contrast there. But now here comes the trick. I'm going to take a little piece of 220 grit, fold it in half, and I'm just going to run over the. You see what's happening here? I run over that, and it makes that pop right out. Now I'm going to go along the edges because that's where it's going to wear. Not too much just enough but that gives me a nice aged look and I like that let's zoom in on that a little bit if we can all right so again that's an easy way to make it look rustic um, it certainly beats the look of that or that and remember the black the ones that come pre-painted black already you can do the same thing you can see I've scuffed that up a little bit right there it's a real easy way to make things look more rustic okay guys the next thing I want to show you is I want to always encourage you make your gu guitars unique somehow so when people say hey how do you know he made that how do you know it's one him? Well, the trademark of my guitars is two things. Number one, if Tammy's signature is not on the back of the headstock, it's not there. Um, I'm typically known to put nickels in. Um, this one is from the Dust Bowl era on this guitar. And I've also put one in. We're just going to call for some tricky camera work. A 2019 nickel because that's the year of the festival. Um, you can also do quirky things like this. You can also tell it's one of my guitars because there's always a grease zerk on the lower front corner. Why? Just in case your plan gets rusty. But think about get coming up with some quirky little trademark thing that makes your guitars unique. Now, I want to show you something that's a typical problem that people have. You know, we put a strap button, guitar strap button on the top uh, of the guitar on the back right here. But then if we were to put another one here, these guitar bodies are really short. And you end up with somebody 
um, having it wrapped around them, it's very uncomfortable. And then they tend to be neck heavy anyway, uh, especially when you're using like cigar boxes. So with this here, you want something to be really practical, but also you want to have it go with the theme of the guitar so it's not a clash. So I'm going to show you a little rigging trick from the oil field here that works. Well, I'm not trying to stall here, but again, if I put a strap button right here or up here or somewhere, it just never seems to balance itself. So what I do is I take a piece of leather like this or a piece of sash cord. Now, what is sash cord? Well, for your younger guys, they used to have weights inside of window frames and the weight uh, would hang over here on this piece of cord. This would run up through a pulley and this would come down and attach to the window. So when you slid the window up, the weight would slide up and then the window would go up and down like this. And sometimes you'd be in an old house and you'd hear a thump and you'd think there was a ghost. Well, the sash cord broke and the weight would fall is what's going on. But anyway, I can take a piece of leather or sash cord about eight inches long double that it's about 16 inches long I'm not using the metric system this time for the people out there been whining about that anyway I'm gonna cut this off right here I'm gonna tie a knot in it so it doesn't fray out like so on the sash cord but the leather I just tie a knot like this so I've got an endless loop like so Fold it in half, not on this end. Okay, so let's do some oil fill rigging number 101. Let's say I want to go around this piece of wood like this, and I take this around, I'm, I'm doing this like a choker. Now, you'll notice that this one's coming through from the bottom. If, but the desirable thing is I would run the one coming from the top through the one from the bottom. Because if I do it the other way, what's going to happen is when I pick this up, this is going to slip wherever it goes to. You see what I mean? Until it adjusts to the one coming from the bottom. What does all that mean? Well, when I put this through, now this is going the wrong way. This would be on a left-handed guitar, but I've taken this folded in half piece. I'm actually going to use this leather one here. But I'm going to come through the top like this. And I'm going to go like so. Now, wherever I want this to stay, let's say I want it to rig right here so it gives me the angle so the guitar hangs right. I'm going to pull this through here like so. And the one that's on the bottom, I'm going to cinch that around and work it around like this. And I guarantee you, if I go through the bottom one, top one through the bottom one, I can just put a carabiner on it like this and hook it into a guitar strap over here. The other end of the strap goes to my button and whatever I want to do, it will stay. Now, let's say the guitar isn't hanging right or it's uncomfortable. You see this a lot in coffee can guitars and odd weighted guitars. I can even put this underneath here like this and slide it and pull it through and the guitar will still hang like so. In fact, I could pull this all the way over to here like so and it stays wherever I want it so again always go through the one on the bottom to make it stay so once I figure out where I want it to be it could be up here even as long as it's doesn't reach this point it's good so always go underneath then the top one goes through the bottom and it cinches up now, I know that was long-winded and complicated, but what are you going to do? You're going to put a, a strap button here, try to figure out if it's here, and try and wait it out, right? When you explain to the artist that you get the guitar to or whoever's playing it, that they can simply do this trick to adjust it. It works out a lot better. So there's a few handy hints for you, some of them uh, more aesthetic, others practical. All right, there it is. I hope that helps you out. I hope that um, it just triggers your mind. I don't expect anybody to do what I'm doing. It's very flattering when someone does. Uh, but keep that brain thinking. Make your guitars unique because when you do, 
they're only yours and people want your stuff. I want to do one final shout out before uh, we go. Uh, you remember in the video I did about the, the low volts coffee can guitar being played live. I told you if you could tell me what year the Buffalo Head Nickel was in the on the guitar in the electric chair episode, then I would give you a signed Tim Lohman low volts Rome with you uh, CD that I got there that night uh, when I filmed it. And hey, the lucky winner is my friend Charlie Jewel in Paris, Florida. Charlie, this is coming your way. I appreciate the pictures you sent, nice guitar builds, and I appreciate a good word. And I especially appreciate your patronage and everybody else in watching my channel. So, until next time, see you later.